This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. I want to talk a little bit about Aquinas at the beginning, and then I want to make some observations about our contemporary situation, and then go back to Aquinas for some guidance. Um, I do want to talk about religious pluralism, but I want to talk about pluralism more broadly, uh, how to engage in a pluralistic context. Uh, I think it's it's often more difficult now to engage uh, in a pluralistic political setting than it is a pluralistic religious setting. Uh, so at least uh, at least it's it seemed that way to me. Uh, and one of the things I want to say at the beginning, and I'll come back to this later, which is that um, we can think about refuting, persuading, defending views that we have, persuading others, refuting opposing views and defending views that we have. One of the things that's uh, that's that's uh, sometimes difficult to do, especially if you're trying to convince others of it. Um, one of the things that we ought to aim to achieve when we can is rational disagreement. Uh, disagreement is easy. Rational disagreement is hard. And it's sometimes a significant achievement just to get to rational disagreement. And I'll say more about that later. The What I want to suggest to you about the situation that Aquinas found himself in in the 13th century is that Christianity, Western Christianity, was facing, I think, one of the biggest crises that it would ever face. I, I think, actually, it's one of the two biggest intellectual crises that Christianity has faced. I think the other one is um, Darwinian evolution, and that's not because of the conflict between a um, an evolutionary account of creation and a six-day account of scriptural creation. After all, St. Augustine, way back when, argued in a book called On Genesis to the Letter, a literal interpretation of Genesis, argued that Genesis should be interpreted literally as teaching that there's not a six-day creation. Uh, Augustine interprets that as six revelations that God gave to the angels about creation, but the creation actually took a great deal of time in its development, at least. But the Darwinian challenge is really a challenge in the sense that you seem to have an interpretation of the development of all life, including human life, that leaves out of the picture anything about divine activity or divine creation. So there's a big challenge there. Why do I say, I, I don't think the Galileo challenge comes anywhere close to this. Galileo was mostly political issues that were going on behind the scenes. The idea that it it would shatter faith to debate whether the earth or the sun is at the center was actually almost as preposterous back then as it is now. There were issues of authority that were involved there. Who gets to teach what about what? But the threat to the Christian intellectual life was not great with Galileo. It's huge with Darwin. It's huge in the 13th century for this reason. Christians had uh, the church fathers uh, and then um, really eminent philosophical theologians like Augustine and Boethius on up into the 12th century had developed a rich philosophical account of the world that was worked out within the context of faith such that views of human nature, of the nature of reality, of ethical and political life were all thoroughly incorporated into an integrated Christian worldview. They had snippets of Aristotle and a little bit more of Plato. But what started to happen in the late 12th and 13th century is that the, the full corpus of Aristotle started to come in to the West for the first time. Aristotle wrote on everything, and he didn't write just in dialogue form in the way at least we have 
uh, inherited from Plato that seems to leave a lot of things open and undetermined. Aristotle writes about logic. He writes about physics. He writes a treatise on the soul, which is about all living things, including the human soul. He writes a, a book on metaphysics, a book on ethics, a book on politics. In these works, Aristotle seems to present a comprehensive account of all that can be known about nature, about metaphysics, about ethics, and politics. He presents an account of human happiness as achievable by natural virtue, a conception of God to whom our contemplative longing to know the causes of things is ordered. He gives us a comprehensive account of reality that seems, not, not only does it not make reference to revelation, it seems on the surface to leave no room for revelation because he, has, he seems to have accounted for just about everything that you would want to account for. What compounds this for someone in Aquinas' position in the early to mid-13th century is that these works of Aristotle have been vetted, interpreted, incorporated into Islamic and Jewish thought, especially Islamic thought, for a number of centuries, and then Jewish thought. So uh, Aristotle not only comes in offering what seems to be a rival account, explanatory account of the whole of reality, it comes in with Islamic and Jewish interpretations and attempts by Islamic and Jewish scholars to connect up where they can the teachings of Aristotle with Islam and Judaism. The philosophical development that had been done in the West to this point is impressive in somebody in some ways, but there is nothing as rigorous as what is coming in. Throughout the 13th century, from the early part to the end, there were big questions in the Christian West and in the Christian universities. Should we be teaching Aristotle? Should we be reading Aristotle? Right? And one group wanted to say, no, we ought, to be, we ought to be really careful about reading and teaching Aristotle. Another group, a smaller group, goes to the other extreme and finds a kind of liberation from theology in Aristotle and wants to pursue philosophy without any connection to theology, perhaps even if theology and philosophy end up contradicting one another. So you have a, a comprehensive intellectual threat. Aquinas was fortunate that he was never tempted by either of these two extreme views, largely because he was a Dominican who had as his teacher Albert the Great. And Albert was, before anyone really in the West, immersed in not only Aristotle's texts as soon as he could get them, but the Islamic and Jewish texts that came along with them, the interpretations of these texts. And he's eager to learn everything that he can, not only from Aristotle, but also from the Islamic and Jewish thinkers insofar as they help him understand Aristotle and help him understand the truth. At a certain point, sort of midway through Aquinas' career when he's very busy with lots of other tasks, teaching Dominicans, working in universities, he decides to write commentaries in his free time. You can do this over the break. You know, you're just about done. In your free time, take up Aquinas' project of commenting line by line on every one of the major works of Aristotle. This is what he did and, and you'll see these pictures of Aquinas with his fingers where he's sort of counting. Sometimes that indicates him counting, here's the first argument, here's the second, or here's the first objection, here's the second. It might also be that he's going from one scribe to another scribe to another scribe where he was known to be dictating on three different projects. Right? So he's writing his own summa. He's commenting on Paul's letter to the Romans and he's writing a refutation of Averroes on the soul. 
Um, just a remarkable ability to go from one thing to another. And he was also known in the midst of lecturing on these matters to be taken up at a moment's notice into contemplation, into a direct contemplation of God. So a remarkable, integra a remarkable intellect, a remarkable integra integration of faith and reason in his own person and in his life. But Aquinas presents us with, I think, a really admirable example. Do we refute and reject this? Do we embrace it as if it had nothing to do with faith, as if it could we could pursue it independently of faith? No, we take the time first to figure out exactly what is being said and to figure out where what is true that we can embrace and where there might be questions that we need to investigate further and where there might be problems either in the text of Aristotle or especially in some of his interpreters. This is a common practice of Aquinas and of the Dominicans to find common ground in a text, an issue, and a shared authority on which, on the basis of which you argue with people who are from other philosophical positions or other religious traditions. That's an introduction, on just some introductory comments on Aquinas' situation as a young Dominican. Let's shift to our own situation. So, we're not very good at um, rational. You might have noticed this in our culture. We're not very good at, at rational discourse. We're not really very good at discourse that requires us to put together a series of subjects and verbs in a coherent way. Um, we have trouble. We struggle with these things. And especially when we disagree with people and especially on social media, the default position is increasingly that anyone who disagrees with me is both evil and stupid. That is, they have no idea what they're talking about, and they're bad people. Right? This, is our, this is not a position that we reach after patiently investigating and getting to know the person and his or her arguments. It's what we assume immediately when someone disagrees with us on Twitter. And almost any tweet, it can be about almost anything, if there are a bunch of subtweets, within about four or five subtweets, people are arguing about whatever it is that they're most worked up about. Civic friendship for Aristotle is what holds societies together. Right? That's why he says lawmakers aim for friendship more than they aim for justice. Because if you have, and it, this is friendship not in the sense of, of best friends, but if you have a kind of amity amongst people in a society, the first thing that's not going to happen is that you're not going to be super litigious, right? The ancients saw that if you had friendship and good customs, you wouldn't immediately resort to lawsuits. But if you lack that, you become increasingly litigious. We're so litigious that we have to wait for the Supreme Court to decide everything that we agree upon. We can't even do it at the level of local courts anymore. During the, was that just three years ago, the Kavanaugh hearings? It seems like it was, we've been through so much, it seems like it was 40 years ago. During the Kavanaugh hearings, when you thought that things couldn't get uglier in American society, boy, were we naive, um, uh, Jonathan Haidt, the social psychologist at NYU who writes a lot on bias. He also writes a lot on, uh, on rational disagreement. Uh, I did events with him in D.C. a few years ago on this. Tweeted, if you want to know how we got where we are right now in the middle of the Kavanaugh hearings with all of us wanting to kill one another, um, he said, here's a survey that gives you a picture of this. The survey asked the question, and it started in the 1980s and went up to at least three, three or four years ago, asked Americans, do you hate members of the opposite political party? 
that sits from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, at, a, at it hovers around 15%. By the time of the Kavanaugh hearings and for a number of years before, it wasn't just provoked by those uh, uh, events, it was around 48%. That's a huge increase in the number of people who are saying, I hate people who disagree with me politically. It's not a healthy situation, and it's also not likely to lend itself to rational disagreement. The founders had a sense of this. I mean, they didn't know about social media, but they had a sense of this, right? Because one of the chief evils in the political order that they're worried about is what they call faction. And they're worried in some sense about precisely the kind of faction we have now, which is the faction, the division of factions that could tip everything one way or another, right? What they wanted to do was to multiply factions, right? And multiply sources of authority, local governments, state governments, federal, balance of powers in, uh, in the three branches, but they also wanted to multiply factions. Better to have more religions rather than just one. Right? They were worried about what we're worried about, and which is the partly what motivates us to hate people in the other party. There's some rationality to this, right? Which is that we fear with each big battle that it's all or nothing. That if we don't win this, we're going to lose everything. And people on the other side think the same thing. In that context, what happens is not Newton's equal and opposite reaction, opposite reaction, but exponentially higher on each side, right? And each time that happens, it confirms in the other side just what they suspected about their opponents. This is that the founders were aware of this. Ancient political theorists were aware of this danger of faction becoming so heated that you verge on civil war. Lots of books about this, right? There are two really good books uh, sort of on the, on the political right, Arthur Brooks's book, Love Your Neighbor, and Ben Sass's book, Them, right? uh, Why We Hate One Another and How We Can Heal. The folk, that Sass's book, the focus of Brooks's book is on what he calls contempt which is the thing that he sees rising in our culture and that he most wants to correct. I like both of these people. I like the way their minds work very often. I like the books, but the books both share a certain limitation, which Aquinas would want us to think about, which is that they want civil discourse for the political order, well and good, but they let truth drop out. And for the philosophical tradition running from Plato at least up through Aquinas, the reason we want to have rational disagreement rather than merely contempt or rather than merely dismissing people as stupid and evil before the conversation even gets started, is that we stand to learn something. Both if we're disagreeing with someone, we stand to learn something from the person we disagree with. Others who might be listening in on the conversation also stand to learn something if there is rational disagreement. I want to have rational disagreement rather than vehement denunciations because I can learn something and maybe, although this ought not to be my principal thought, maybe others can learn something from me as I try to articulate my views as clearly and as rigorously and as vigorously as I can. Right? It's because I want to avoid falsehood taking root in my soul that I want rational disagreement. And I also should be wishing for falsehood not to take root in the souls of those I am disagreeing with or those who are listening in. So rational disagreement is important because in a pluralistic setting, one of the advantages 
of encountering others who disagree with me is that I can come to a better understanding of the truth. There are always blind, at a minimum, there are always blind spots in our own thinking. And we need others, we need friends, we need family members. We also need people who just disagree with us to help us to see where those blind spots are. And that's not just a matter of me becoming more adept at refuting other people. It's principally a matter of me coming closer to the truth through disagreement. We've given up on persuasion. We've given up, interestingly, on conversion stories. We don't like conversion stories anymore, right? We like to identify culprits. By culprit, I mean people who disagree with us and dox them or cancel them. So we want to identify the culprits and punish them. If we were really believing in and pursuing the truth, what we would want is to celebrate conversion stories. Right? The, the, The great mode of arguing, the most persuasive mode of arguing. Augustine's Confessions is structured entirely around a series of his own conversion stories, from his pursuit of pleasure and ambition, to his falling in with the Manichaeans, to his being liberated through a kind of Socratic question and answer with the head of of the Manichaeans, to pursue Platonism, to his realizing that while Platonism showed him the goal, it couldn't provide the way. And finally, his conversion to Christianity through grace. It's a series of conversions, right? The pivotal point is when he goes from North Africa to Rome, right? Where he says, I left where I was before because the students were unruly and wouldn't pay their bills, Right? So they wouldn't pay their tuition, and they kept disrupting his classes. When he gets to Rome and meets Ambrose, he says to God, I, I was motivated by this. You were motivated to bring me to Rome to meet Ambrose. Right? So the, the series of conversion stories are for Augustine a way of providing multiple points of contact with pleasure-seeking, ambith, ambitious orators and would-be lawyers, with adherents of the Manichaeans, with various adherents of Platonic philosophy, what he's trying to do is to find points of contact with people that he knows in his midst are committed to pluralistic, to other views, and he wants to persuade them through his own conversion story to take his final view seriously. How does this show up in Aquinas? The thing that students find so difficult in Aquinas, the disputed question model. If you've sat down and tried to read Thomas Aquinas, you know that particularly in the the late great Summa, he asks a question and then he lists objections, then he responds, and then he, then he, uh, he gives a response and lays out his own position. Then he returns to those objections one by one. We find this very difficult to follow. As Joseph Pieper once said, the disputed question is a latter-day version of a platonic dialogue. It's Aquinas attempting, vicariously, because all these people are not sitting uh, in the agora with him, vicariously to bring various voices into the conversation. And he's always careful to show where each voice grasps the truth and where it doesn't, right? As Aristotle says in the metaphysics, the pursuit of truth is in one way easy and in another way hard. It's easy because no one can fail to miss it. No one can miss it completely. It's hard because we only grasp parts of it, right? So there's this great model 
for disputation and for arguing that Aquinas finds early in Aristotle's physics. I won't go into too much detail on Aristotle's physics, but Aristotle's trying to outline the principles of change. And he says, well, you have a substance and then there are qualities. So there's a, there's a, 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 a subject, there's a form, and there's a privation. These are the principles he ends up with. But he's basically trying to refute or provide an alternative to extreme views in philosophers who existed before Socrates. One from Parmenides who wanted to deny change because what is cannot come from what's not. So therefore, it must have already been. It's a, a logical argument in some sense, but you know something's gone wrong because we see change. And then Heraclitus, who said everything's always changing. Pantare in Greek, all is flux, right? You can't step into the same river twice or even once for Heraclitus, right? Because it's all changing. So what Aristotle does is to go through and show that neither of these really give an account of the experiences that we have of change, where change is real and obvious, but it's not completely chaotic, right? It's not complete flux. At the end of this book in the physics, Aristotle says, I'm going to go back to Heraclitus and Parmenides and show the truth that they apprehended and where and why they went astray. The best way to engage with a rival position is not just to refute it, but to show what is true in it, and then to show from the view that develops out of that, give an account of where and why it went wrong. That's the most compelling argument for Aristotle and for Aquinas. And that's why Aquinas is so patiently taking up all of these objections. He has an inexhaustible appetite for objections. And in fact, Pieper's right, not just that it was a reflection of the Platonic dialogue in the ancient world, it was actually a reflection of living debates in the medieval universities, where on certain days a professor would walk in, someone would shout out a question, and the professor would have to take up that question, and then there could be 100 people in the room. There would be 13 objections that would immediately be shouted out. The professor would have to remember these objections. He's not writing them down in pen and paper and then resolve it and respond to each of these objections. These are living debates, taking objections seriously, both because there are always things to be learned from the objection. The best philosophers I've ever known give good talks, but they really come alive in the question and answer period, where they're asked a question, and you think, oh, that's a tough one. And suddenly, the person responds by saying, okay, here is my response to your objection, but actually your objection rests upon uh, this assumption and this other objection. And I'd like to say something about those things too, right? So knowing the position of your opponent, if you want to put it that way, better than the opponent does, is something that Aquinas thinks is obligatory for philosophy at a deep level. And that also means affirming whatever truth can be found in that other position. As I mentioned earlier, Aquinas set aside all this time just to get clear amid all these disputes about Aristotle, what is Aristotle saying? One of my challenges for you is, as you're thinking about your own views and defending them in a pluralistic setting with people from other religions or people from other political views, how educated are you about your own views? There's this little thing called Aquinas 101, if you're interested in that, that the Thomistic Institute has put together, which is a great uh, accessible introduction to Aquinas. Part of what you ought to be interested in, if you're interested in defending your views, you ought to be interested in knowing increasingly more about why you think what you think. I grew up on the other side of D.C. and um, was born in D.C. and then grew up in Hyattsville and College Park, went to DeMatha High School. Uh, and uh, went to Catholic school until I got to college. And I wasn't even sure I was going to go to college. Neither one of my parents went to college. I went to the University of Maryland because all my friends went to the University of Maryland. Back then, you could, if, you had a, if you had a pulse and you could write a check, you were accepted in the University of Maryland. It's a lot harder now to get into the University of Maryland. 
And I declared myself a business major because all my friends declared themselves business majors. Halfway through my first semester in classes where I had two atheists as teachers, who uh, one of whom I still stay in touch with, who taught me philosophy, I realized that there were, I didn't know really what I believed. I certainly didn't know that anybody had asked me, I would have said I was a Catholic. I didn't know why I believed what I believed. But that experience of having people who thought they weren't mean to me or anything because I was a Christian, but they found it kind of amusing that people still took this seriously. And this was back in the, in the, uh, the late 1970s. But for me, it was a kind of awakening that I don't know what I think. I don't know why I believe what I believe. I certainly wanted to have arguments that I could give. But the first thing I realized was I'm not very well educated. And in trying to get educated, I actually found a calling to philosophy and to teaching and to writing. But, I, but that moment when I realized, boy, I'm not very well educated uh, about what I think, that was a really important moment. And it, it forced me to kind of back up because I wanted to argue with people. And I wanted to show that I was right and they were wrong. And then I had to back up and realize, you know, the more important thing for you is to figure out actually what you believe and why and to know some things. Aquinas did that at every step. He does occasionally get infuriated, very rarely. There's this character called David of Denant who equates God with prime matter. Aquinas says of this person, calls him stultissimus, which means the most foolish person on the planet. He gets worked up about certain Islamic views of the soul that he thinks deny personal immortality. He gets worked up about Averroes, whom he has great respect for. He calls him the commentator on Aristotle, right? the commentator. But when he gets worked up, what he tends to do is to try and construct better arguments on Averroes' behalf and then to refute those. Right? So he doesn't simply say, I've already shown where this is false. When, when Aquinas gets worked up, he says, okay, here's an even better argument that they didn't give me, but I can develop this on the basis of their principles. And here, I think, is what's wrong with that. This desire to get at the truth and to have as many people come at it from as many different perspectives as is possible. The Dominicans had practices, Aquinas uses these, of trying to find common ground. So he says at the beginning of the Summa Contra Gentiles, with the Jewish people, we argue on the basis of the Old Testament. With Christian heretics, we argue on the basis of the new. And with everyone else, we resort to natural reason, which everyone has access to. When Aquinas talks about Christian heresies, heretical views of the Christian faith, particularly when he talks about heretical views say, of the Trinity or of the Incarnation, particularly the Incarnation, right? Views that exalt divinity and seem to deny the humanity of Christ. Conversely, views that exalt the humanity and seem to deny the divinity. What Aquinas says is he does the same thing as he does with philosophers. A heresy is a grasping of part of the truth that's been turned into the whole truth. I'm sure Chesterton says something like that somewhere in one of his books. But Aquinas says it, right? What they've taken is certain passages in Scripture that emphasize divinity or certain passages that emphasize humanity, and they've neglected the other. The truth is whole. The truth is unified. The truth is symphonic. What error does, what heresy does, is to pull out part of that and mar the beautiful whole that is the cosmos that God has revealed to us. So whenever we're disagreeing, we're disagreeing with someone who's Protestant or who is Islamic or who is Jewish, we want to try to find some common ground. Finding common ground doesn't mean that you're pretending that you agree about everything, right? Rational disagreement, as I said at the outset, is an achievement. If you can actually figure out with someone else where you disagree and why, that's significant progress. 
I want to end. I'm happy to take questions. I don't want to end with one quote from Aquinas and then a quote from John Henry Newman. Um, I love uh, at the beginning of both summas when Aquinas raises this question about whether um, theology, in theology we can prove the truths of Revelation. Some portion, which he calls the preambles of the faith, God exists and so forth, we can't. But the most important ones about the Trinity and the Incarnation, we can't. What can we do with those, though? Well, Aquinas says if there are objections against them that seem to have been brought forth from philosophical reason, we know, because God is one and God is truth, that what we know by reason and what we know by faith cannot contradict one another. Therefore, he says, it is possible to answer them. I love the combination of confidence and humility in Aquinas saying it is possible. We know that if there's a conflict here and we're certain about some things that we've received from faith, that it's possible to respond. That doesn't mean that any of us, even Aquinas, right now, upon hearing the objection, is equipped necessarily to refute it. But Aquinas is not anxious about that fact, right? There's a, a beautiful line, a, a beautiful set of sentences from Newman that I want to end on. Newman says there are three things. In, in Newman's talking about the way in which we, our intellect develops in such a way that we're always trying to move out from whatever unified center we have to take into account new perspectives or to widen our knowledge. And that, when we do that, we're forcing ourselves, in a sense, to look at what we already know from a new perspective and to see it. And that can be uncomfortable, right? Actually trying to learn stuff can make you, can be painful because you're going to have moments where you're going to experience uncertainty. And Newman thinks that what we need to do is then figure out how to adjust what we know in light of the new knowledge that we have. He's talking about philosophical knowledge here and even experience in such a way that we digest it, as he says, and we pull it back into this center where we continue to be unified, but then we're looking for whatever the next thing is that we need to understand. He says there are three things here. Truth cannot contradict truth. It's the first thing we know. The second thing we know is that Often it's the case that truth seems to contradict truth. The third thing he says is, when we experience that, we ought to be diligent about trying to resolve it, but we also ought to be at peace about the fact that we're not going immediately to be able to resolve it. Because after all, if you have an intellect that is awake and trying to learn, encountering through a pluralism of views, philosophical, theological, religious, you're going to find yourself always having new moments where you don't know exactly what to say. But you're also going to find yourself having, as you have an expansion of knowledge that then becomes integrated, you're also going to find yourself with increasing resources to draw upon in your encounter with anyone, no matter what perspective they might be coming from. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So if we're in discussion, let's say, with someone who's not of the same faith we are, um, or someone who's like Protestant or something like that, yeah. and they come up with a point that you've never heard before, and you don't know how to refute, and you're just dumbfounded for a second, that doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. Correct. It just means that you have to kind of do your own digging and research. Yeah. So how would you yeah. have us go about that saying, hey, I don't, I'm not well equipped enough to, to debate that and discuss that with you, but... Yeah, no one, likes to, no one likes to be wrong. No one likes to be ill-equipped to respond to questions. But if you're, you got to become less concerned. The, for the ancients, the, the crucial thing about truth is that it's not mine. 
right? I mean, for in Plato, this is the fundamental. This is the fundamental realization, and it's it's through the the especially this dialogue the Gorgias. Robbie George is a name many of you all may be familiar with. Talks about his own conversion to philosophy as an undergraduate, reading the Gorgias, and and realizing that. The pursuit of truth is not about me. It's not about my views. It's not about the view of my family. It's not about the view of my tribe, my political party. It's not even about my religion if the accent is on my. Truth is not about me. I want to be connected to the truth. That matters. But the truth is not my truth. And one of the things we need to, and this is actually, this is painful in a way, but it's also liberating. The truth doesn't need me. Right? I mean, maybe I can play a role here and there to help other people to see things, the truth. But the truth is not about me being in a position to be right. So if, if we shift to that perspective where it's not so much about am I equipped to respond, but how do I get at the truth and how when I'm in a genuine conversation with someone else, how do I pursue it with them? How do I offer what I know? So, and, and this is where it comes down to getting educated. But in the Catholic tradition, in the Thomistic tradition, that's primarily about pursuing knowledge and wisdom. It's not primarily about refuting others. I want to, first of all, refute errors that are in my own soul, and then encounter and argue with others. And the reason I'm concerned about the pursuit, the reason I'm concerned about refuting opinions is because those are obstacles to getting at the truth and to pursuing wisdom. And in these cases where we encounter others who have different views, Newman says at one point, we're in a really bad position if we're trying to just argue with people about the faith. The objector, particularly the cynical objector, um, this is a a sermon he delivered called On, On Personal Influence in the Pursuit of Truth particularly the cynical objector, is in much better shape than we are if we're sincerely trying to respond. Because the cynical objector, Newman says, can pick something pretty remote and sort of weird. And for us to account for that thing, we have to, get, we have to bring the person through about six stages of conversation to get them to see why that. And they can always pick something that we think is peripheral and make it the center of their objection. So Newman thinks we're always in a bad sort of position when we're trying to just argue. Now, if we're asked to give an account of why we believe what we believe, that's different. Because then we can give an account of how, we co- how we've come to where we are, right? And why we think it's true. That's much better than being in the position, it's really uncomfortable, right? To be in the position of someone saying, why do you Catholics think X? It's like, whoa, okay, let's back up and let's talk about other things that we believe that lead to that, but it's really complicated. Um, The better educated you are, the more resources you have. And also the more you can kind of back up and say, you know what, here's some things that that, that once troubled me or that still I'm not clear about. It's fine to say that with people when when they're disagreeing with you. I mean, not to, to simply capitulate, but to, to back up and say, you know, I'm not sure about that. I mean, we're not asked to be able to have a refutation ready at every moment as Catholics for objections. And, and we find ourselves boxed in thinking we have to have a response to the objection. Sometimes it's fine to admit, you know, I'm not sure about that. If you want to hear why I believe what I believe in other ways, I'm happy to tell you that. And because of those things, I accept 
what Scripture says or what the church teaches or whatever it might be. But I think we, we ought to try to avoid, because people are trying to box you in when that happens, right? Yeah. They're trying to make everything hinge upon your response to this matter. We ought to not allow ourselves to be put in those positions as much as possible. They're uncomfortable, and we, we don't have a responsibility to occupy that spot, right? Unless we've, uh, unless we've just given a lecture on it, and, and we say, I don't have a clue, right? That, that would not be good. But does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, and having this all be part of, see, if, we, if we're not thinking actively and trying to become more knowledgeable and more wise, then these things hit us as really weird and peripheral, right? If we're actively always, or at least regularly, trying to become more knowledgeable, more informed, more wise, then somebody has an objection, you think, huh? That's another, obje- that's another question for me to think about because your mind is already engaged in formulating questions, right? Um, there's a, a, a Jesuit philosopher, Bernard Lonergan, whom I don't agree with on everything, but the, the one thing that I love from him is the statement that the educated person knows how to articulate the next relevant question. The next relevant question, in some cases, presupposes a lot of knowledge, Right? It's it, the educated person, though, is always thinking, okay, we know this and we know this. How are these things connected? Or what's the next stage? If you're a person who's actively thinking and reading and talking seriously with other people about what matters, then somebody objecting to you is not going to come as some weird thing. It's just going to be, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I've am i sort of been thinking about something related to that, right? And here's what I think. Not, not in the sense that you're delivering the final truth, but that you've got a mind that's actively engaged as a Catholic thinking about these matters. Yeah. Right? I think that's the best way. And, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's an awful lot that we have in common with all other Christians, and even with Jews, and even with Muslims. Finding some things that we share in common that we can draw upon so I'm, I'm in regular conversation with uh, the president of faculty at Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California, which is the only Muslim accredited liberal arts college in the country. Um, Hamza Youssef, who is the president, is a really brilliant, interesting guy. Their whole project there is to attempt to go back to these debates of the Middle Ages between their Islamic scholars and Jewish and Catholic scholars, and attempt to rethink their own tradition as a way of, in their own words, pulling Islam out of the various crises that it's found itself in in the last two or three centuries, really in the modern world. They have a journal that's called Renovatio. It's deliberately not called Reformatio. It's called Renovatio, because what they want to do is to go back to these medieval sources and attempt to pull out of there those resources that they can use to help the Muslim communities of today engage faith with reason, engage with other religious traditions. And and they just eat up talking about Aquinas. Why did he think this? Why did he think that? Now, there are disagreements, obviously, right? And those come up at times. But the sheer pursuit of serious religious people who realize that modernity means a lot of things. One of the things it means for all of us who are uh, members of religious traditions that go back a ways is modernity involves a kind of severing, a disconnection from our sources, from our traditions. And it's one of the things that I find at Baylor where I'm surrounded by not just Baptists, but Protestants of various sorts, uh, Orthodox believers, and even some Jewish uh, colleagues, is that very many of these people are engaged in a kind of recovery where they realize they've been cut off from their sources. And they realize that they need to recover that in order to survive and flourish in the contemporary world. And in that project, there are going to be disagreements, and, and we don't pretend that we agree about everything. 
But there's an awful lot that we can learn from one another in that project. Because in that respect, we're all sort of similarly situated. We're all attempting to recover things that we're always in danger of losing. Because modernity is about amnesia, right? It's about forgetfulness. And, and, and anyone who belongs in a religious tradition that's been around for a while wants to overcome that amnesia. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking about the state of interreligious dialogue in the U.S., and my impression is that it's largely driven by practice. Like, the goal is political practice, particularly concerning the goals of the religious left. And there are smaller movements yeah. focused on contemplation. Like, in a peer of at UVA, um, here has the scriptural reasoning movement, which seeks to bring uh, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish believers together around the scriptures. So yeah. that's definitely um, a great step in the right direction. But I'm wondering if you see a tension with like the, the noble goals you're articulating and the, the state of this dialogue in the with Jewish practice. Yeah. So, and, and that's, um, that's a very old movement, right? The praxis-driven ecumenism, mm -hmm. right? Particularly on the religious left. I think that's right. Um, I think in the religious right and center, there's, there's much more of an interest in the kind of project I just described that Zaytuna's engaged in. Um, and also an attempt to, um, so when, when I was running the Baylor and DC program, as I, I mentioned, doing events with Hamza Yusuf, we did a number of events, one of which was with Hamza and um, uh, Rabbi Sachs, who just died uh, last fall, Rabbi Sachs and Robbie George on uh, views of secularization from three different religious traditions. So that wasn't a matter of going back into the sources and attempting to debate and talk about what, what those older debates, but it was really the riches of three different religious traditions, thinking about how they were analyzed and how they respond to secularization, right? Because again, this is a topic where if you're serious about faith, anybody from any religious tradition has to come to terms with this, right? And there you're not pretending again that you agree about everything. And it's not just a matter of praxis. These, these were not, we didn't have political talking points at the end of this, right? This was actually people from three different religious traditions attempting to bring the wisdom of their traditions to bear upon a contemporary issue that we all, the, the other thing that we suffer from is a, an impoverished vocabulary and, and an absence of rich narratives, right, to describe our lives. And, and again, part of this is a kind of recovery of going back to our sources, discovering things there that we maybe didn't even know were there that can be enormously rich for us today. And, and these are the kind of conversations across religious. You do have a somewhat politically applicable project, right, with uh, the first things model of evangelicals and Catholics together of about 20, maybe 25 years ago now, right? Um, that was also about sources, but that was a little bit praxis oriented. But I would say the more interesting discussions now are the, in, are the discussions of across religious traditions of uh, trying to, to uh, bring our resources to bear on the problems that we're all facing. Other questions? Yeah. Can you just elaborate, like, what about modernity, like, severs us from our roots? Well, I mean, that's it. Um, I'm tempted to tell you to go read the collected works of Alistair McIntyre um, and, and some others, and Remy Brog, uh, who complicates McIntyre's account in interesting and helpful ways. But, and I don't agree with McIntyre on everything either, but, um, but I, you know, modernity is about the very word, right, is about a, a kind of proclamation that we're setting ourselves over against the past, right? So that the danger for us in thinking about the past now is that we, um, we think about it almost exclusively as a source of error and bigotry. Right? And so 
we have a kind of um, arrogance about where we are, an unearned arrogance, right? Uh, an unearned pride in sense of superiority and where we are now simply because we exist after all those woe-begotten views of the past. That, if you, if you have that pervading institutions, right, which it does, and pervading popular and intellectual culture, then you very quickly lose connection to the past. And it's not as if the past is just to be affirmed and handed down. First of all, that's impossible. Even if you take the West, right? The West is a series of conflicts and disagreements of the most serious and deep sort. You can't just affirm the West, right? Because you got to take a side in all sorts of debates. What you're inheriting there really is a series of debates. Um, so we lose, we start to think that the past is all uh, uh, homogeneic, right? That it's all one thing. And we end up with really superficial views of it that allow us to dismiss it very quickly. So I think that there are lots of institutional and practical reasons why this comes about, but this, this sense of throwing off the past as something that's riddled with error and bigotry, and there is error and bigotry there in the past and in the present, and there will be in the future, um, and we hope to make those things better, but we end up losing all, we have no roots unless we can grow out of certain things in the past, right? And this involves engaging with what we receive. It's not merely passive obedience to the past, right? It involves actively engaging and to some extent critically engaging with it. These, these various sources, and it's pretty unified what Aquinas received because it's based upon unified philosophical texts that everyone's talking about, but the disagreements are huge. And Aquinas has to inherit those disagreements and then attempt to move the argument forward by navigating the disagreements. It's not about erasing them, and it's not simply about dismissing what's erroneous. Right? Because what's erroneous can actually teach us. It can continue to teach us. Yeah? Um, you talk about dialogue as kind of already presupposing or granting that truth is external to people and that they kind of share in this discussion of truth together and that's how you get to a solution or an agreement. Um, how possible is that to do in an increasingly relativistic society, including and particularly among religious relatives? Amongst, in religious disagreements? Well, I guess, relative, relative yeah, people, um, people who, I guess, take up relativism, but I guess in particular as well. So, yeah, let me say a couple things about that. Uh, I mean, the, the first thing is that, um, we're, we're really not a culture of relativists. We're a culture of moral absolutists. Um, we might be theoretically a culture of relativists. We're, we're relativists when it suits us. But we're really not relativists. The problem with us is a kind of puritanical zeal. One of the interesting things, when you talk about religious pluralism, well, as religion has declined in our public life and in our personal lives, our politics has become increasingly zealous. Right? Our politics is taking on the worst features of religion as it has existed historically. And you know, I think about um, moral absolutism among the young, and this is not all that surprising, right? I mean, human nature abhors a moral vacuum. And we have created, partly through relativism and partly through just throwing young people back on themselves as if their consumer choice could expand beyond clothing and iPhones to things about how they're going to lead their lives and who they're going to marry and what they're going to believe about nature and God, as if that could get them anywhere. So we've thrown young people back into this horrifying vacuum. You couple that with isolation and loneliness and depression, 
it's not surprising that young people would be seeking moral truths that have an, a, a, an excessive clarity and absolute character to them, and that they would want to enforce those moral truths. Because everything beneath the surface seems like it could, seems like quicksand. Right? And when everything seems like quicksand, you're going to cling to whatever it is you think is true desperately. Right? I mean, one of the things that surprised me, maybe it shouldn't have, when we went into the pandemic, was you think, oh, you've got this, this kind of catastrophic event and it has to do with a virus. Maybe, maybe people will start to recover something about nature and human nature. But that really hasn't happened. Now, the ancients had this view that crises could bring us back to fundamental truths. I think there are reasons, partly the reason it has happened is that we're so immersed in worlds of technology and screens that it's hard to get back. The other thing that happened is that everybody just doubled and tripled down on the ideological views that they went into the pandemic with. It, it In almost no cases that are prominent, did it cause people to deeply rethink what they thought going into the pandemic. It just made us double down on whatever ideology we already believed. And we were more certain than ever that the other people had an evil and stupid ideology than we were even before the pandemic. Is it possible to have, I mean, I started out describing how awful we are at public discourse. I also think that you need to be careful about with whom and when you engage in disagreement. Because there are lots of people now on all sides of the political spectrum who simply want to use conversation to trap people. And so it's always prudent to say, you know, should I engage here or not? It's even more prudent now to ask yourself that question. Because you have no obligation to get into a conversation with someone who's, I mean, people can be cantankerous and a bit mean-spirited. That's one thing. People who use conversations to entrap and, and solely to use you to advance their own agenda, that's stuff you need to watch out for and just avoid. And you're better off just walking away in silence than you are engaging. So there are lots of ways in which it's really difficult to do this. Here's a practical suggestion on this. Don't write off friends because you find out they have a particular view that you find objectionable. Don't write them off for that reason. Now, I realize that there can be views that you can disagree with that are very important that might fracture the friendship to the point where it becomes unworkable. That's one thing. It's another thing to start writing off people simply because they have views, especially in the culture we're in now where everybody's forced to sort of adopt extreme views. Don't write people off. In this uh, sermon that Newman wrote on personal influence, he said it's not, it's not argument. It's not catechism. Catechism that someone willingly submits to is a different thing. It's not argument. It's not catechism. That's going to turn people toward the truth. It's your personal example, and it's especially your friendship. So to the extent that you can sustain friendships and not sustain them in a kind of stoic way, because you really can't have a friendship that you're experiencing as extremely painful, to the extent that you can learn to enjoy still being with people you don't agree with about everything, doesn't mean that you're sacrificing your own view, right? And if they ask you, you answer. But to the extent that you can maintain friendships over time, to that extent, at least this will be true. That that friend will not think that people that hold the views that you do are all evil. And in the long run, that may actually prove to be a significant difference for that person. Right? Yeah. Last question. I didn't know if it... If no, it no. Okay, okay, go ahead. What role does humor have in like, these discussions? Because I've noticed that 
humor's ability to both increase contempt, but also like lead to the truth. And how do you use humor in a way to like bring people together? And unite? So, you know, as a philosophy professor, you you try to figure out. We're all trying to figure out as professors how to be careful about things, but as philosophers, we also want to go at the issues, right? I've got a colleague who speaks for the Thomistic Institute a lot, Frank Beckwith. You all may may have had him here, or and Frank's a Frank's a really dear friend. We found out when we both arrived at Baylor in around 2003. In conversation, we had a lot of people we knew in common we'd never met. We found out that we were born on the same day and got married on the same day, not. The same day, month, and year. So both birthday, November 3rd, 1960. We both got married July 11th, Feast of St. Benedict, 1987. Uh, I don't know why I told you that. It's just kind of just kind of interesting. And, and here's another anecdote from that. So uh, Frank's wife, who's named Frankie, and is is a a lively person, um, as is Frank. We were on one of these little planes flying from Waco to Dallas. And there's a row of one seat and then two seats. And we were one after another on the one seat side. We get really horrible turbulence, just really bad turbulence. And um, smart aleck that I am, I said to, and I think um, I was sitting here, Frank sitting here, and then Frankie. And I said, Frank, you know what? I said, we came into the world on the same day. <laughs> and I hear Frankie yell, shut up, Tom. <laughs> so anyhow, my, my colleague, Frank Beckwith, that's funny, right? So there's some humor. Okay. So um, my colleague, Frank Beckwith, is really good at this in his classes. So he manages to, and, and it's partly because he makes fun of himself and his own views. So it disarms the students. Right, who all of whom antecedently think you can't disagree with the professor. Right, if you can disabuse them of that, maybe they'll actually start to think that they can disagree with one another in a way that's civil and serious. Right, because we can't have rational disagreement. We can't have engaging across pluralism if we're all terrified of speaking what we think. And this is another uh, phenomenon in our culture. Right, it's not just that we. Um, hate people who are of the opposite party. We're also afraid increasingly to say what we think. Right? And there's some reason for that fear. It's not entirely irrational. But Frank manages to make fun of himself and his own views in a way that, now he's a professor, he's not just sitting down across the table with people, right? that invites others to come into the conversation. I always tell students, I want to, uh, in my classes, I just taught a moral philosophy class, and many of them know me already and know what I think, but I always tell them, look, I, I, of all these guys we're reading, I like Aquinas the best, but don't assume that simply because you say that you agree with Aquinas, you're going to better get a better grade. If you make a bad argument for Aquinas, I'm going to be more offended. Right? I'd rather have you make a good argument for a different view than a bad argument for my guy, right? So, because I don't want them to think, and in fact, they were kind of quiet when we did Aquinas. Aquinas is hard to read. It's sort of hard to get your mind around it. But So I started just raising serious objections to Aquinas to get them to feel like they had raised objection to Mill and these other thinkers doing Aquinas. I started to raise objections to Aquinas, and there are lots of them that have been raised throughout the centuries, just to get them to think, to see that I didn't think that this stuff was just obvious and foolproof. So using humor, using indirection uh, in a way, I think, um, using um, having a good sense of humor and warmth in any conversation with someone you're disagreeing with is always better than not, right? Because people might come away saying, they might be more surprised by you having that disposition toward them than they will be by what you're going to say. And that, at some level, also indicates a kind of confidence, right? At least a, that you're confident that you're, you might not have it all figured out, but you're, you're confident that you're oriented in the right direction. 
and that merely hearing an objection is not going to throw you off. Uh, so, I mean, sometimes we think we show confidence by coming down hard with refutations, make arguments, people have different styles, but confidence is really shown in that, that kind of humble way that Aquinas just says, it's possible to respond, and, and I'm confident that we can. Uh, I might not be able to do it at this moment, but I'm confident it can be done. One one last question, if there is one. Yes. Okay. So in your talk in the Q and A, we touched on um, practice and social ethics as well as contemplation and understanding as goals in our own style. But I'm wondering, what about personal ethics? Should we at all like aspire to greater human flourishing and greater uh, practice of virtue through our dialogue with others? I think, for example, so three years ago, Thomas Joseph White, the director of the Chi, published a book called The Light of Christ, which you're all familiar with. Yeah. Where he expounds the basic doctrines of the Yeah, it's a great book. Paul Griffiths wrote a very critical review of it in common deal. He basically said, a life's not a grammar. Like, what will draw people to faith is not Say it slow down there. What Paul Griffiths for me. Yeah, book. what but what was his what was his comment? The tagline was a life not a grammar. So what draws people to the faith, he argues, is the lives of the saints, the lives of the saints and temporary verses, not systematic dogma. Which I agree with very much. And I'm wondering, um as Catholics or Christians where do you think the life should fit in? Into our yeah. So, uh, and I think that, I think probably Father Thomas Joseph White would say correct yeah. on that point, right? But, but not that the, not that that makes the arguments unimportant, right? And the, and the arguments, the arguments for Aquinas is not writing his books for atheists or Muslims or Jews. He's engaging, he's writing for young Dominicans mainly and university students who are already Christian, right? The arguments there are important for them to advance in wisdom. The good of argument is intrinsic to the life of wisdom, right? It's not merely a good that we think of as playing an extrinsic role of refuting those other people. Right, the arguments help me to advance toward wisdom. You know what, what I just mentioned about Newman is—I mean, that's what Newman's saying, right? So Newman writes the idea of a university when he's asked to set up this new Catholic college in Ireland, and he defends. If you know anything about the book, you know that what he defends there is that knowledge is its own end, right, and that universities have a function that is peculiar to them. They have, as McIntyre might put it, goods internal to the practices of a university. And these are the pursuit of truth in its complexity and its unity. Newman is defending this against all sorts of utilitarian views. He's also worried about certain kinds of religious views, Catholic religious views in Ireland at the time, that think that knowledge is dangerous and you just want to teach young people to pray. And, and attend to the sacraments, all of which Newman thought was important. But he defends knowledge, wonder, and knowledge and wisdom as, as desirable for their own sake. And this is what liberal education is. But then at the very end, he says, well, this is where he's, he's talking a bit about the difficulty of arguments and conflicts. And he turns to St. Philip Neri, the last three pages of the lecture. St. Philip Neri, who didn't focus on refuting, didn't even focus on teaching. Neri was known to be available to anyone, no matter what level in society they came from. It says he wove beautiful conversations that brought people into the faith, and his Wherever he was, Newman says, was a house of Christian mirth, of joy and happiness. It's just a beautiful phrase, a house of Christian mirth. He doesn't use the word hospitality there, but Neri is embodying the virtues of Christian hospitality. And, you know, how often do we as individuals or do we as communities particularly in Catholic institutions, do we not embody Christian mirth or Christian hospitality, but a kind of nasty pusillanimity 
that even if our arguments are great, are going to turn people off. And so if, if our aim is to persuade people, arguments play a role there. And as I've said, not that you're going to refute and convert people. Give that up if you've got that in mind. You're going to become the person who just shows up and answers objections and converts people. Right, Because half the time, even if you do that successfully, the impact on the person's soul is that they're going to resent you, right? And Because they don't like to be shown not to know the truth about what they're asserting. But arguments are important because all of us need to advance in knowledge and wisdom, and also because there are often third parties who hear or read the arguments and they're in much a much more receptive position than the person we're fighting with, right? But both the person we're fighting with and third-party observers are going to be moved by us and by our communities if we embody the virtues of Christian hospitality, along with, and part of that is, a love of knowledge, and part of a love of knowledge is a love of lively, rational disagreement. Thank you.